Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, Dina. Well, we're going to talk today about writer's rights. First, I have to make a disclaimer. I am not a writer, nor do I play one on TV. So nothing said here should be taken as legal advice. If you ever do have questions about your rights or your copyrights, uh, there are lawyers proficient in copyright law, and you can probably find one of those. So what we're going to talk mostly about today are the rights we sell on our work. But what most writers want to know first is how do I copyright my work? Well, as soon as you put it in tangible form, in other words, as soon as you write it down or you type it into your computer, it's automatically copyrighted. You don't have to register it with the copyright office. I did meet a, an author one time or a writer who uh, at a conference one time who said she she copyrighted every single magazine article she wrote. At the time, it only cost $35, but now it's, I think it's $45 plus, I think, a, a $65 application fee. So it's it doesn't make it worthwhile to do that, and it's really not necessary. If you, if you do ever write for magazines, and I don't know what all y'all do, but if you do write for magazines, the magazine itself is usually copyrighted. Mm -hmm. um, and copyright covers both published and unpublished works. But... Copyright does not protect ideas, only the written expression of those ideas. So, you know, 100 people can have the same idea and they're going to come at it from a different perspective and a different different way of, of writing it down. Mm -hmm. um, you also cannot copyright titles. And you will occasionally, and I, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, naming your next book to kill a mockingbird because <laughs> even though it's not copyrighted it'll be a little confusing but you will occasionally see a title with uh, a tm a little tm beside it or a, an r with a circle around it in that case it's been trademarked uh, occasionally companies do that chicken soup for the soul is one example they have trademarked the title chicken soup for the soul so once again you can't use that title but a lot of other titles are recycled uh, you can reuse them, but you don't want to get you don't want to make it confusing for the for writer or readers to find your book. So it's good to come up with a, an original title. Um, now I do recommend, uh, even though I don't recommend trying to copyright every little little small piece of work you do, I do recommend that you copyright books if you are self publishing, uh, and, and of course if you're going through a traditional publisher, they'll automatically copyright it. But those are larger works of body and hopefully will be around for a long time. So those do need to be copyrighted. Now, you probably know the little symbol for copyright is a little C with a circle around it. And when I first started writing, I would put that on every submission that I sent to a magazine or, or devotional publication. I don't recommend doing that either because it's really kind of a sign of an amateur. Editors know that your work is copyrighted and they are not in the hot habit of, of stealing anyone's work. So you, it's just not necessary to do that. So um, I do, however, um, recommend that if you have a website, that you put a copyright notice on there. But mm -hmm. one thing a lot of people don't understand that just because something's on the Internet doesn't mean it's in the public domain. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's free to take without any attribution at all. So that little copyright notice kind of reminds people that, no, this is copyrighted material here. Now, um, if you have any more questions about copyright, you can go to copyright.gov. The, the law is a little bit gray. It's hard, hard to understand and hard. It's, there's no solid line. You can't cross this line. And we're going to right now, we've talked about copywriting our work. We're going to turn this around and talk about other people's work who is copyrighted that we might want to use or quote from. So once again, I say go to copyright.gov and read what the exceptions are because there are a few exceptions that you can do that without actually asking permission. Um, there are things like um, educational purposes uh, for criticism, and I think that would include reviews, uh, news reporting, uh, research or scholarship, parodies. Those are all possibilities that you might not have to ask for permission. But the safest way to use a quotation from someone else's work is to get permission from the copyright owner. That's the way you can protect yourself from ever being accused of plagiarizing or stealing someone else's work or breaking copyright law. 
Now, some of you may write songs or poems. I know I spoke to a group earlier this week. A lot of them were poets. I do not recommend ever using a single line of a poem or a single line of lyrics in your writing. The, the music industry in particular is very protective of their copyrights and their, and their artists. So I would not use anything without permission or unless it, if it was in the public domain. And people think that's funny sometimes. I've had people laugh at me because you can go online, you know, and you can find the, the lyrics to a whole song. They may have permission to do that. That doesn't mean you have the permission to use that. So it's, it's better to, to just be safe rather than sorry and not ever quote from a song or a poem. Yeah, you know, um, and again, you may not post something from another person's website. And let me give you a couple of tell you a couple of stories about something that happened to me um, that kind of get that exemplifies this. Uh, one time, most many some of you may know that I have a news letter for writers. It's called the Write Life, uh, and in that I solicit articles from people. And Susie, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, now I thought Sally, I'm sorry, Sally Stewart had given me permission or had sent me an article to use in my newsletter. If I don't, if y'all don't know who Sally Stewart is, she uh, originated the Christian Writers Market Guide and, and edited it for probably 20, 25 years. She was in writing for many, many years. And she had sent us this used to, meant to be used exclusively for our newsletter. Well, a lady that very day that it came out, that the newsletter came out, another writer I knew, took the article, the feature article, and she posted it on her blog. Well, she did not ask permission. She did credit Sally. She kept, I always post a, a little copyright symbol and, and the name of the author who, or writer who writes the article. And she kept that, but she did not credit our newsletter. She did not even mention our newsletter at all. And as I said, it was written exclusively for us. So I contacted her and asked her about it. She said, well, Sally said I could use anything from her website, and but it wasn't from her website. So once she understood that she was kind of infringing on our, our rights to publish this, she took it down. So that's something you, you kind of have to be careful of because, you know, we get excited. We want to repost something and we can always post links. There's no problem with that. But when you post something that somebody entirely published, and without their permission, that's not that's not right. And as as Christians, we don't want to cross the line. We don't want to do something, even if we can get away with it. We don't want to do something that's infringing on other people's rights. In another instance, I had asked a writer to write about an article for my newsletter about character arc. I thought I don't, you know, I never really seen too much about that at the time, and. I thought, well, that might, might be interesting to our readers. So she did. She sent an article. I read it. It was good. And suddenly I just felt like I needed to check it out. I just, I didn't know much about character arc. I didn't know much about this writer. So I went online and looked up the subject. I just thought, I, I just want to make sure she's on topic, that she's what she's saying is, is right. The first article I found is from Wikipedia. And I do not rec recommend Wikipedia as an authoritative source. You probably all know that. It's not something you want to quote from, but it's a good way to just go if you want to quickly find out about something. Hmm. So I found this article about character art. The article she had sent me was taken word for word from this online Wikipedia article. She had wow. never mentioned it. She had never credited it. She sent it to me as if it were her original work. My co-writer, my co-director of Right Like Workshops had to peel me down off the ceiling. <laughs> I feel responsible that what I'm sending out to my readers, my subscribers, is not plagiarized. So I waited a couple of days before contacting her until I could calm down a little bit. And I gave her, the, I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt. I said, you know, maybe stop this article on Wikipedia. So I sent her an email and I said, did you by any chance send, write this article on Wikipedia? And I sent her the leak. She sent back one word reply. Nope. Whoa. Okay. 
I cannot use this article. I said it is taken from word for word from this Wikipedia article. I said we cannot use it. it and I sent her links on plagiarism. I didn't directly say you plagiarize this, but I sent her all these links. And I declined to, to publish anything else from, from her. So once again, we have to be careful what we're doing. We have to get permission. We have to cite the sources we use. We have to protect other people's copyrights as much as we want them to protect ours. So that's basically all I'm going to talk about about copyright. Again, you can go to copyright.gov and find out more about it if you're interested. But now what we're going to talk about is the rights that we sell in our work. And, you know, we don't actually sell an article or a book or a devotion. What we sell are the rights to for a publisher to publish our pieces. So we need to thoroughly understand what rights we're selling, or we may inadvertently give away something we didn't intend to. And in this case, what you don't know can hurt you. So the first rights we're going to talk about are book rights. And this is actually going to be a very short talk because as, according to Dr. Warren Baker, I met him years ago at a conference. He, he's passed away since, but he was with AMG Publishing. And I went to one of his workshops. He said, book rights boil down to nine words. It all depends on the terms of the contract. It all depends on the terms of the contract. When you publish a book with a traditional publisher and even with a hybrid publisher, you will get a contract. You need to read it carefully. And make sure you understand what rights they're asking for, what they're giving away. They say book contracts are getting more and more complicated. And once again, I am not a lawyer, and I'm sure most of you aren't too. So it's hard to understand some of that language. I recommend that you get someone knowledgeable to review the contract for you. If you have an agent, that's that's the agent's job to do that. The agent is there to look out for you. And I hate to say it, but the publishers are not there to look out for you. And that's there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way it is. They are there to look out for their rights and to get the most that they can out of the book. They're putting money into it. And so that's just the way the industry works. So you need someone kind of in your corner. And if you don't have an agent, there are people you can get to review it. Now, as I've done this, this workshop through the years, I had a couple of people that I could recommend, but for some reason, one reason or another, they, they no longer do that. So I was really thrilled when I went to the Kentucky Christian Writers Conference last year and talked to Lynn Johnson. Lynn has, uh, she, she directed the Right to Publish Conference in Wheaton, Ohio for years. Wheaton, I'm sorry, Wheaton, Illinois for years. I don't think she's doing it now, but um, she's been in, in writing forever. She she um, she's edited magazines. Um, she's she's written bookus of books and other publications. She's just she's just kind of done it off. She's she's just been she's a go getter. And she I, when I talked to her, she agreed that I could pass out her information, and that's on your resource handout. She gave me all her contact information. I don't think I put on there how much she would charge, but she said it would be seventy five dollars. And one mm -hmm. of the people that I used to recommend, it was it was 200 So I think it's a really good price. If you are in a question at all, if you don't understand anything in your contract, you, of course, you can't always ask the editor. But I would always ask someone to review it for me and make sure that um, you are protected in, in what the contract says. Because it's a legal document, you are something. So I think it's always a good idea. So that's basically all I'm going to talk about, about book rights, except I did put on your handout something about motion picture rights. And that is often addressed in a book contract. Now, most of us are probably not ever going to have to worry about this. I know nobody's going to ask to make a motion picture for my devotional book, but some of you may be writing a lot of fiction and you never know. So it's something you want to keep in mind when you look through that contract. Uh, I read something just this week about you don't ever want to give away movie rights. There are exceptions to everything. There, there may be that you would want the, the book publisher to negotiate movie rights for you. It may be that you don't have no idea how to do that. But if you write a book that a movie company wants to make a movie from, they contact you. 
So again, it's, and that's a pretty sweet deal as far as the, the option that they offer you and everything. You can read that. Like I say, I won't read that to you. Um, but that's something you might want to consider when you are, again, signing a book contract. So now let's talk about articles, shorter pieces that you might write. And if, if you are just a book author, don't tune me out because a lot of times we will write articles to promote our books. So the more that we know about our rights, the better protected we'll be. So on selling articles in, in particular, once again, we're not selling the article, we're selling or licensing the right to use that article. And we need to study the guidelines for the publishers we are submitting to because they do not all purchase the same type of rights. So if they say they don't purchase reprint rights, which we're gonna talk about each of these in, in detail, if they don't purchase reprint rights, you don't wanna offer that. Uh, you don't offer them a reprint. You don't want to waste their time or your time, either one. And you can usually find that information in if you're writing for the Christian market and the Christian Writers Market Guide, or you can go to their, their websites or the, the Writers Market, different places like that, that and find out what, what kinds of rights that they purchase. And with a, a larger publication, you will usually sign a contract with them too. If not, then what you've sold are one-time rights or non-exclusive rights. Rights should be outlined in the contract, but if not, that's what you've sold. So you need to keep copies of any correspondence you have in case any question comes up if they don't spell it out in the contract. So you, you can always, like I say, ask them and or offer them a certain type of rights. Now, I didn't, I didn't put this in your um, handouts, but I hope you can see this. Um, I always, when I submit uh, to a publication, you can see it. Uh, but just in general, this is the way you would format it. Huh? Casey, raise it up. We're not seeing. Raise. We're okay. not seeing the whole page. Okay. Well, it's really just at what's at the top that I need you okay. to see. Mm -hmm. So, and you don't really even need to read it. Um, this is this is the formatting for a, um, a submission for a, an article or you know magazine or or other publication. And what you'll do is you'll put your, your contact information, your name and, and all that in the upper left-hand corner. And then the upper right-hand corner, you will say what rights you're offering. Maybe one-time rights, first rights, reprint rights, whatever. Now, I think that's a good thing to do because it gives the editor the idea of what, what rights you're offering. However, if you do sign a contract and the contract differs from that, the contract rules. Whatever you sign, once again, that's a legal document, and that's what you have to go by. So, but it's a good thing, still a good thing to do this, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. So let's go, let's talk about the different kinds of rights you might sell on your work. The first one that we're going to talk about is first rights, also called serial rights, or first North American serial rights. And it's basically what it sounds like. You're giving the publisher the right to publish the work for the first time. So in essence, you're saying that it has never been published before. Publications usually pay more for first rights. So they want a little exclusivity to it um, and they wanna know it hasn't been seen somewhere else. And some will only accept first rights. Again, that's where you need to check your market guide and, and do your research and, and make sure what kinds of rights they want. Now with first rights, the rights revert to the writer after the publication. So after the magazine comes out, after the anthology comes out, after the devotional magazine, whatever comes out, then the rights revert to you. And, but the thing is with print work, that could be nine months or more. You know, they work way ahead. And so don't get excited and say, I sold this article. I want to go with sell reprints on it now because you're going to get to fall if you've signed a contract. Um, so be sure to wait. And then some publishers will actually ask you to wait for a specified amount of time, maybe one to three months before publishing it elsewhere. I know I published with it uh, kind of regularly for a while with a couple of magazines that did that. And so, again, we have to honor the contract and we have to remember it's really good to make up a little Excel sheet and remember when we can legally go ahead and, and sell uh, reprints on something. Um, now, let me ask you this, though. How many of you think that if your article or story were published 
on your blog or your website, can you sell first rights on it? Raise your hand if you think you can sell first rights on it. Okay, I don't see any hands. Well, you're right, but it depends. It depends on the publication. I know Chicken Soup for the Soul, for one, they, they purchase first, first rights. They don't really call it that. They call it more non-exclusive rights. But they say once the book comes out, the rights revert to you. And they say they, they want it to be unpublished. However, they have exceptions. They say if it were published on your blog or your website, your church newsletter, a small hometown newspaper, a small hometown magazine with limited circulation, that it's okay to send it to them. They still want to know, and it's always good. I mean, it's good to be upfront with your editor. It's always important to let them know if it was published somewhere else, but they're okay with that. However, there was another smaller anthology. Okay, Chicken Soup for the Soul is huge, right? There was another gotcha. smaller anthology that said reprints will not be accepted if your story has appeared anywhere accessible by the general reading public, including your own website or blog. Please do not submit it. So again, we have to read, we have to do our research, we have to abide by their guidelines. Now, you can always rewrite an article and sell it for first rights again. Just like mm -hmm. I said, you can't copyright ideas, and they can't keep, um, you know, keep the rights to your ideas. Your ideas are unique to you. So I did this, I, I published actually three different stories in Chicken Soup for the Soul, three different Chicken Soup for the Soul books about a medical problem that my mom had. But I came at it from different directions. Uh, I published one piece in a, the time they were doing some devotional books. So it was more like a devotional story. They, they are big into story. That's their, their mainstay. Did another one about when she was in the nursing home or a, a actually skilled nursing facility and how we discovered her, her problem there. Uh, then I did a third one about when she was back home and we had caregivers and what a blessing they were and how many different skills that they helped her along the way. So it was three totally different stories, although it was about the same main problem, same main incident. I also published probably nine different pieces on another completely different um, family issue. Uh, I sold some in different, in all different publications, uh, devotions, uh, self-help articles, um, just a, a personal experience stories. They were all about the same basic thing, but they were told in different ways. So keep that in mind, even if you've sold first rights, you haven't given away your work. Not only can you sell reprints on that, but you can rewrite it. It has to be very different. It can't be just changing a paragraph or a couple of sentences. It has to be very, very different. But you can do that. So that's first rights. Next one we're going to talk about are one-time rights, also called simultaneous rights. And these are when you would send something to multiple markets at the same time. For example, a, a timely news article. You know, by tomorrow, it's it's going to be old news. So all these people... They're sending these things out. You see syndicated publications, syndicated article. They're sending it out to all these newspapers across the country at the same time. So it gives the publisher the right to publish it the first, I mean, one time, but not necessarily the first time. Somebody's going to publish it the first time, but they know they're not guaranteed that when they're buying one-time rights. Mm -hmm. So these are used for non-competing or regional markets. Um, so just like the newspapers you're reading down there are not the same news news newspaper we're reading here in the Memphis area. Um, so that's uh, non-competing or regional markets. As I said, it's most commonly used for newspapers because they are in different regions. But it can also be used for denominational publications, which do not overlap. So in other words, the Methodists aren't reading the Baptist magazines, the Baptists aren't reading the Presbyterians magazines. There are so separate audiences. And so in that case, you can use one-time rights for those and send them out. If it's a pub, if, say for those denominations, that if it was a non-denominational 
article that could apply to any of them, then you could submit to all those publications. One-time rights are also commonly used for photos and graphics. So if you ever sell those, that's probably what rights you would be selling on those. So now let me tell you another story. And this is why I think it's so important for us as writers to understand the rights we are selling. At one time I was writing regularly for a Christian newspaper. This guy had newspapers in I think five different cities and he wanted local news from each of those places. We never had a contract. I would just pitch him an idea and he would say yes or no if he wanted it. I would write the article and send to him and then he would pay me. Well, at the same time, I was in a very active online writer's loop. And a lady in there said she was writing for newspapers. And, but she said that the newspaper editor had told her that he owned all of her columns and articles she had written for him. She said, that wasn't what I understood. And I said, well, that wasn't what I understood either. So I got a little bit worried. I contacted the editor. I said, I just want to make sure we're on the same page that I still own all these articles that I sent you. He said, oh, no. He said, I paid for them. I own them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I contacted Sally Stewart, the one who did the Christian Writers Market Guide. She had also published a book called How to Get Published. And that was the very first book that I ever read front to back about writing. And in that, she had talked about a little bit about this. So I asked her the question. I said, we don't have a contract. I said, you know, does he own my articles? She said, no. She said, he's talking about all rights. He's, that he's purchased all rights. He, she said, he does. Unless you have a contract, he can't do that. What, he's sold, what you've sold are non-exclusive or one-time rights. Oh. So I went back to the editor and very humbly just told him what she said. I didn't say who, but I said someone who's been in the industry for years, for decades. This is what she said. To his credit, he also was in a, a, a editor's loop, writer's loop online, or editor's loop online. He went to them and asked the question. They set him straight. They said, no, if you do not have a contract, you have not purchased all rights. And so you do not own those articles. So that's why it's so important, us as writers, to understand our rights, because sometimes even the editors don't. All right, now what we're going to talk about are all rights, or also called exclusive rights. And on your handout, I've kind of lumped these together with work for hire, all rights and work for hire. But there are some differences. In both of them, the writer gives up all rights to the work. The publisher may publish the work in any format without providing any additional payment, but the writer cannot sell reprints, et cetera, on the work. So it's as close to them owning your work as possible. Now, in all rights, though, the author does still retain the right to state that he authored the work, but he can't publish, market, distribute, or create a derivative work from it. The rights will revert to the author after 35 years. I don't know about most of you, but I don't think I'm going to be around. <laughs> so that's not going to do me any good. Wow. Now, I have also read, I read this a few years ago, that some publishers, so this will be going back to book rights, will ask for outright submissions on books. And they said, basically, this is the same thing as selling all rights. So you would basically be selling the publisher the rights to your book with no strings attached. It would belong to them. I don't know if they're still doing this. I've never seen this, uh, but it's something to, to watch out for. But we need to be cognizant of how these things can be kind of concealed. And I'm, in that case, I think it's a little bit sneaky. I don't think most publishers are, going, are trying to sneak around and do this kind of thing. But we need to understand the terms, and a lot of times we don't. And there may be new terms coming up that I'm not aware of. So that's why I think it's important to get someone who is knowledgeable to look over your book contract. So we're talking still about all rights. And I was always taught, don't sell all rights on your work. 
but there are exceptions just like with anything else. Now, if you're writing curriculum, that curriculum is usually used over a long period of time. They're issued, it's issued in various formats. Um, and you're not going to write, say, a textbook for this publisher and go over here and write the same textbook for another publisher. So normally they would buy all rights. So that's one case you might want to sell all rights. Another case might be if the payment is very high. Do you want to pay me $1,000 for an article? I'm, I might consider selling you all rights on it. Another case might be if the market is very limited, say if it's a topic that you're not likely to sell elsewhere and then they are asking for all rights, you might consider doing that. Another time might be if it's a very outstanding credit. Uh, guideposts mostly ask for all rights on their articles, their devotions, and, and I think just about all of their publications or maybe one or two that they don't. But Guideposts is the top selling Christian publication in the country. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a coup to be published with them. Reader's Digest is the same way. They've been around for years. I don't think they're nearly as popular as they used to be. But from what I've heard, they, they purchase all rights. But then again, that would be a coup to be published in Reader's Digest. So it's up to you what kind of rights you want to sell. As long as you understand, I just want you to understand anyway, what what you're giving away, what you're selling. Now, all rights are also often published in academic writing. So peer reviews or scholarly publications, you know, they kind of want just one source. Um, that makes it more legitimate, uh, more easily accepted. And so they want one source for this academic writing. So they will often ask for all rights on something. Another case is devotionals, some devotionals. I was so excited the first time I got an assignment for seven devotions until I read the contract. They were asking for all rights. And that, at that time, I was, it was, I was pretty early in my career. And as I said, I had always been taught not to give away all rights. So I contacted the editor and said, do you think we could just negotiate this? He was very kind. He said, well, he said, what we're really buying rights to is your your devotion in our format. You know, I'm sure y'all all probably read devo different devotional magazines and you know they all have different formats. They'll maybe start with a, a verse or a scripture passage and with a prayer or a call to action, just different what I call elements of the devotion. Um, so he said, that's that's what we're purchasing. He said the story idea, which you of course you probably know too, that most devotions have some kind of personal experience story. He said the story idea you can rewrite and use somewhere else if you want to. But he said we're we're buying it in our format. Once he said that, it made me feel a little better. And I have I have sold all rights to quite a few devotions since then. So that might be one instance where you want to do that. Now, one time, and it was funny because I think it was the same publication that I saw one of the uh, one of the devotions I had written for him published on a, a website. I think it was a church website. They had my name, but they didn't reference the publication at all. Mm -hmm. I had sold all rights, so I really, you know, I didn't have anything to say about it. I had been paid for my devotions, and that was it. But I thought, I wonder if they got permission. So the next time I was talking with the editor, I said, by the way, did you see that one of my devotions was published on this website? Did you give them permission? He said, no, I didn't. And I think he went and had them take it down. So once again, we have to remember that this is copyrighted work and we can't just, you know, just post it on our, our website or our blogs. So well, again, uh, you decide if it's if it's worth it to sell all rights, and a publisher may negotiate. Um, and I let me tell you this too: I, I did sign one contract one time for an article that said they were buying all rights, but they gave the writer the permission to use the article after three months in anything that they wanted to. So they could you could sell reprints on it, whatever. And they called it a non-exclusive perpetual license. Well, I had never heard that term. And once again, bless her heart, I went to Sally Stewart and asked her about it, if she had ever heard of this. She said, no, I've never really heard it put that way. But he, she said, as long as they're giving you rights to use it 
after publication, then I don't see anything wrong with it. So I did sign the contract and, and published a couple of articles with them. But once again, we have to understand our rights to know what it is we may or may not be giving away. And I want to reiterate that it must specifically state in writing that we are selling all rights for us to do that. And I'm going to throw this out there. I don't know for sure if it's true. I have never seen it happen, but I just want to throw this out there. I read one time that, you know, if you get a check from a publisher and on the back, you have to endorse it to, to cash it or, or deposit it, that it could say, Endorsement of this check indicates the transfer of all rights. Um, that would be sneaky. <laughs> wow. So, but again, I guess it behooves us to know what we're signing, even if it's the back of a check. You know, we need to know what we're signing. Um, wow. So watch out for that. I, I can't see that you would come up against that from a Christian publisher, but just just know that it is a possibility and be sure to read everything that you, you sign. Now, if you have signed or given away all rights, or I don't say given away, but if you have sold for all rights, you can ask for the rights back if you decide later that you need to republish that or want to republish that article or that piece. Now, some the publishers will not give you rights back. I read uh -huh. a couple years ago, Thomas Nelson would buy all rights and they wouldn't give them back. So know that it's just, it's a chance that you're taking. However, Lynn Johnson, once again, the one who will review contracts, she said that she has asked for rights back on several things and gotten. But let me tell you another story. This is about my friend who uh, she and I started Right Life Workshops. She had written years and years ago. She's a nurse like I am. And she had written for uh, academic publications. One time she wrote an article on, I think it was on disaster nursing, very specific and sold it to a, a magazine. I think it was a nursing magazine. They paid her $800. She was thrilled about that. I would be thrilled about that nowadays. A few years right. later, she was writing a textbook. She and, and someone else were co-writing a textbook. She wanted to use this piece in the textbook. Mm -hmm. um, you know how sometimes you just, you just know it's good. What you've written is just the way you want to say it. And you don't want to mess with it. It's going to mess it up. So she contacted the publisher, asked them if she could get the rights back. They said yes for $1,000. Oh, they were going to charge oh, oh, her oh, more for oh, her oh, 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 than they paid her in the first place. That's right. <laughs> they said, never mind. I'll rewrite it. Wow. <laughs> so just know you may or may not ever be able to get your rights back to something wow. you still have rights on. <laughs> So we said work for hire is very similar to all rights, but there are some differences. For one thing, uh, you the rights will never revert to the author if you sell if you do a work for hire on a work for hire contract. So it was intended just to cover writing done by employee while being paid a salary. So in other words, when my husband worked for FedEx and he wrote documentation on programs or or a, um, a manual. That did not belong to him. He was doing it as an employee and it belonged to FedEx. And I often think too about um, Rob Petrie and Dick Van Dyke, even Sally and Buddy, when they wrote all those scripts, those uh, scripts for the television show, those did not belong to them. They belonged to the producer. So it is often used in entertainment industry because think about it. You know, a lot of artists, different artists may be contributing to a movie and they can't all own the movie or a piece of the movie. So they will often buy all rights for it. It also may be used in ghostwriting. Some of you may have come across that. Uh, in a ghostwriting arrangement, the author gives up all rights to the finished product forever. It basically belongs to the person whose story they're telling. And they may, in fact, sign a confidentiality clause. And in that case, you can't even disclose that you were the one who uh, wrote this book or whatever. You know, think about it. All these um, movie stars and um, uh, sports stars and public figures, they're not writing their own autobiographies. Somebody else is writing those for them. But you will never know that because their name is the only one on it. 
And really their name is the only one that is going to sell the book pretty much because that's what people are looking for. They're looking for um, autobiography for that by this person. Yeah. Now, and I don't know if y'all are familiar. Uh, well, I'm sure you know who Cecil Murphy is. He's the New York Times bestselling author of 90 Minutes in Heaven. He did a yeah. whole lot of ghost writing, especially early in his career. And I think he probably signed quite a few confidentiality, confidentiality clauses in his time. But you'll notice more and more in his later books that it's it says by so-and-so with Cecil Murphy. Um, I right. think he got so he his his name was familiar. He was well known. He was trusted. And a lot of times the writers were willing to give him credit. And in fact, I think probably his name sold some of those books, too, because the, he was so well known and so trusted. So, uh, you know, you may or may not have to sign a confidentiality clause if you do some ghostwriting. Now, work for hire is really never intended for freelance writers. But again, there are exceptions. So not only in these other exceptions I've mentioned, but if you write Sunday school curricula, uh, Bible study guides, compilations of quotes, you may be asked to sign a work for hire. Uh, John Riddle, uh, he is he's a card. He is going to be the keynote speaker at the Kentucky Christian Writers Conference next month. And I actually got to hear him in a in a whole one day workshop when he came down to our area. He said that he's he's done a lot of work for hire and he loves it. He said that he one time he wrote a uh, middle grade biography. It wouldn't take a whole whole lot of research. He didn't take him a whole lot of time to do it. They paid him five thousand dollars for it, and he was done. He can move on to something else. He didn't have to worry about promoting that book. You know, all this marketing that we all hate, he didn't have to worry about it. So he loved doing that. That might be something you want to do. Right. Just consider a book for hire in that kind of in that kind of instance. You know, a lot of us write books. I'm probably never going to make five thousand dollars on my book. I'm tell you right now, I won't make five thousand dollars on my book because we get very little, especially when we go through traditional publishers. So publishers. So if you want to make some money. That's a way to possibly make it is do some books for hire. And he's going to actually, uh, he actually is writing a uh, an article for my newsletter that comes out next month about finding, or about the, the books for hire that he's written and finding publications or books, authors or book publishers that want to do that. Okay, so we've talked about all rights and book for hire. Now we're going to talk about non-exclusive rights. <clears throat> If you don't specify what rights you're selling and the publisher doesn't specify what rights he's buying, then you've sold non-exclusive rights. Mm -hmm. After they publish it the first time, and this is my understanding of it, they can use it in a succeeding issue of the same periodical, but not in any other periodicals they publish without further payment. Now, this differs from the, the first rights and some of the rights that other publishers buy. Let me go back to Chicken Soup for the Soul. They retain the right, and it's in the contract, that they can publish your story online. They can publish it in another book. Uh, sometimes they will draw stories from books rather than sending a call out to do a new book. They'll draw stories from their previously published books, and they'll publish in a new book. And in that case, I don't get any payment for it. I've done that twice with, with two of my stories. Um, they they send me a, a copy usually and they don't even have to do that um this last time they sent me 10 copies they said if i would help promote the new book that they would send me 10 copies to give away at book signings and other places and i thought that was pretty nice but they do not have to pay me again because in the contract it says that they have the right to use this any way they want to in fact you can sign up for a story a day from chicken soup the soul and they may send you they send you your story if you've been published or my story but um, if you felt sold non-exclusive rights, they're not supposed to use it except in one, one succeeding issue of that publication and any other publications that they, they use, unless the contract states differently, as I, as I mentioned. However, you can then sell reprints on it. Again, keep copies of all correspondence and what rights you've sold so that you know for sure what, what you've sold and what rights you retained. And if you don't, if you don't know what rights you sold, you can always write to the editor and, and ask. 
Another type of rights are electronic rights. Most publishers will buy electronic rights along with the print rights that they're buying without paying you any extra. Now, it used to be back in the day that some, some publications would pay extra for electronic rights when electronic rights were still pretty new, when they were still pretty new at putting things online. I got, I got that one time and I thought that was pretty cool, but that was the only time I was ever paid extra. Um, some will also sometimes uh, write you for permission to use your article. Uh, I know one time I uh, published an article in a magazine called Women of Spirit, and they decided they wanted to start a ministry for Chinese women, and they were going to start a website and asked if they could publish my article on their website for no payment. They didn't have the, the money base to do that. They wanted to put it online to minister to Chinese women and translate it into Mandarin Chinese for them. And I said, that was fine. That was OK. So, mm -hmm. again, it's up to you to decide what you want to do. Uh, you do, however, need to make sure that what you're giving away, whether you're selling or you're or giving away, is our non-exclusive electronic rights. Because, you know, many um, websites will archive their work online and it may be on there for years. So if you sell exclusive rights, then you you don't get, you know, you you do not have the right to then publish that anywhere else. So mm -hmm. make sure that it says non-exclusive rights. Otherwise, it's kind of like selling all rights to it. If they archive it online, then they do not want you to sell it elsewhere. So make sure you read, again, the contract or, or what they're asking for. And um, so you can always ask, have them clearly specify or spell it out for you what it is they're purchasing. And do know, too, that if you have um, sold a, an article or published an article with an online, a large online Internet site, that you're probably not likely to be able to sell it to print publications after that. It's maybe as a reprint, possibly. Um, but uh, I did that one time with CBN.com. They're a huge site. At the time, though, it was important to me that they would post a link back to my website. So again, it's up to you and depends on what you want to do and what's most important to you at the time. But just know that you may not be able to sell it in a reprint, I'm sorry, in a um, print magazine if it's been appeared in a large website that's maybe been seen all over the year, all over the world. And uh, the last rights we're going to talk about are reprint rights, also called second rights. These are used in mar different markets where the re readership doesn't cross. So we mentioned denominational magazines, different ge geographical locations. Uh, I had a friend who one time wrote an article for a parenting magazine. It was about diseases get kids get from swimming pools. And so she, I guess, I assume she sold first rights to that magazine, the Memphis Parenting Magazine. And then after it came out, he uh, started looking up parenting magazines in other cities, other large cities, which they're not going to be reading our magazine. So the readership does not overlap. And she started submitting to all these other magazines. So that, to me, reprints are a good stewardship of your writing. You've already written the piece. You've done the majority of the work. It would just take a little bit more work to research and find other publications who will accept reprints and who might be interested in your topic and then submit it. Um, you might have to shorten or lengthen it a little bit depending on the their guidelines. But hey, it's not like writing the whole piece to begin with. So it's a way to make a little bit extra money and there's nothing wrong with making money. I've met people before who think because we're Christian writers, we can't make money on our writing. That's not true. The, the labor is worthy of his hire. It's, you know, it's okay to do that. We don't have to give away our, our writing. Now, on reprints, the, the uh, you're going to want to let them know if you're, if you're writing a query letter to a publication about a piece and it is a reprint, then you would need to let them know in the query letter. You don't have to tell them when or where it, pub it was published unless they specifically ask for that in their guidelines. And again, you would need to wait until that first piece uh, is published if you sold first rights on it before you start trying to sell reprints on it. Um, and you can sell reprints to one more than one publisher simultaneously. So just like my friend did, you can sell these, uh, send these out 
simultaneously to different publications. Sometimes the original publisher wants to be credited. So in that case, there would be a little notice at the bottom of the article saying originally published in such and such magazine, such and such month and year. Some do not want to be credited. Again, you need to, this is why you need to know what's in your contract because there was one contract I signed who said, we do not want to be credited if you republish this work. Uh, I think it was because they didn't know where else it might appear and they might not agree theologically with that magazine. And so I can understand that they wouldn't necessarily want their name associated with it. So this, these are the rights that you might sell. There actually may be other types of rights. I ran across a couple last week when I was looking some things up. Um, so again, it's important for you to know about these rights so you know what you're giving away. In the resources handout, I do have a few links to some articles on my website. One is called um, Three Red Flags on Book Contracts. It was written by a lawyer. Three things mm -hmm. I never would have thought about looking for. Um, so I, I urge you to go to those links, use those links and go to those articles and read about those. And also the article about the, and so maybe, maybe Tina, if, if she's already, she may have already sent it out electronically and it's just easier to click on that link. Um, but the article about the photos, um, this was about a lady who took a photo mm -hmm. from the internet that she did not have rights to, and it was not a, you know, a, a creative commons photo, not something uh, in public domain. And she just used it on a blog. I don't even think she had that many followers. She was sued for it. There are people who put photos out there that are actually watching for you to use them. And then they can sue you. She went through a year of a bad time and she couldn't even write about it until everything was over. She was, you know, she was in litigation for quite a while. So just be aware that photos in particular, uh, song lyrics in particular, you may get away with it. but you may not. So why take the chance? 